The next step of the transportation planning model is destination choice. We know how many trips are coming out of every zone. We know how many trips are going to every zone. We want to know how many of the trips coming out of each zone are going to each other zone. We want to match these two. We often talk about origin destination pairs. Geographer Waldo Tobler posited the first law of geography, which says that everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. The implication is that you are more likely to make a short trip than a long trip, all other things being equal. Why? It's more affordable in terms of time and money to take a short trip than a long one. So, if you have a choice between going to the supermarket next door and an otherwise identical supermarket from the same chain that's five miles away, you're going to go to the one that's next door. You can always think of exceptions to this because humans are variable and have hidden motivations. Unlike the representations in our model, real people aren't identical. Maybe he had a crush on the cashier. Overall, this is a statistical relationship that you're more likely to go to one that's closer than one that's farther away. How far away in minutes do you live during the school year from campus? We asked this question in previous years. This is what the trip distribution looks like. The statistical mode is 5 to 10 minutes. The average here is between 15 and 20 minutes. There's a long tail. The statistical median is between 10 and 15. That's not unusual. The greater the separation between two places, the less likely the trip. So nobody was more than 60 minutes away. Nobody was two hours away. Nobody's commuting from Chicago or Los Angeles or Shanghai. The other thing to keep in mind is that the larger the two places, the greater the interaction. If you compare two places of equal size, let's say two towns of 20,000 people and a third of 500,000, the town which is closer to the city will have more trips to the city. In this example, Northfield will have more, many more trips than, than Albert Lee to the city of Minneapolis, despite their similar populations. Which mode is a really important question, because your willingness to travel varies by mode. I walk 30 minutes on a good day, if I have a good pace, from my home to my office 1.6 miles away, rain or shine, snow or sun, of course. If I don't have to go into the office, I won't. That's about as long as most people are going to voluntarily walk each way, because walking requires more effort than sitting on the bus or sitting on a train or sitting in your car. Choice of mode affects willingness to travel. There is a limit to how much we can travel. There is what we call a travel time budget. But more fundamentally, there are only 1,440 minutes in a day. You are sleeping for, on average, 8 hours. If you have a full-time job, you'd be working for 8 hours. There's an upper limit to how much you could actually travel. Logically, the lower limit is zero, though there is an argument that people want to travel some amount every day, so people typically travel more than zero minutes a day. Imagine you are working for 8 hours. You are sleeping for 8 hours. There's only 8 hours left. You're not going to travel 4 hours each way because you would use up all of your other available time. So some fraction of that is how much you'd be willing to spend traveling, and it turns out that that number is, on average, about 20 to 30 minutes each way for most people, and that this average is held for a long time. The mean home-to-work commute duration in the Twin Cities is about 24 and a half minutes for all modes overall. Some modes are going to be longer than others. Students travel for a shorter time than that, which isn't surprising. Many of you also have jobs. If you can avoid it, you're not going to spend a half hour commuting back and forth to school and then a half an hour back and forth commuting to your work because that would eat up two hours of available time each day. The travel time budget constrains how far people are willing to commute. Note also that auto commuting times have remained largely stable over the past 50 years despite significant changes in transportation networks, congestion, income, land use patterns, family structure, and labor force participation rates. The stability of travel time and distribution curves gives a good basis for the application of trip distribution models for relatively long-term forecasting. So, how are we going to predict how many trips are going from point A to point B, from Decodopolis to New Fargo? Some fraction of the trips from New Fargo will stay in New Fargo. Some fraction of the trips from New Fargo will leave New Fargo. Now, in a simple system where we only have two zones, the modeling is something we can do by hand. There are only two squared, or four, OD pairs. Half of the origin destination pairs have the same OD, and a large number of trips will be intrazonal, trips that remain within the zone they started in. In a more complicated system, such as the Twin Cities metropolitan area, the modelers are using 3,000 zones. So there are 3,000 squared, or 9 million OD pairs, only 3,000 of which are intrazonal. Only a very small fraction of trips, though perhaps more than 1 in 3,000, will stay within their zone. We want a model to help us with this. Historically, the freighter or growth model was used. If you know today's demand and you know the rate of growth, so a growth factor of 1.02 represents 2% growth, Next year's demand is just the product of the two. 
This practice is still used in rural areas, but has obvious problems since it takes no account of the structure of the problem. Which is the zone people will most likely go to? We had two stylized facts. One, they're more likely to go to zones that are closer rather than farther away, and they're more likely to go to zones that have more destination than ones with fewer. Recall your physics. What's the force of interaction between two bodies? The mass of one body times the mass of another body divided by the distance between them squared. What's the mass? The mass of one zone is the number of origins in that zone. The mass of another zone is the number of destinations in that zone. Distance is distance, and the gravitational factor is something that we calibrate because it's highly unlikely that people traveling between zones are going to have the same type of gravitational attraction that large masses do. That's called the gravity model, which is one way of predicting the interaction between zones. So the first part of the hypothesis is that there are these two masses, the number of origins and the number of destinations. We can multiply them together. The second part is that the strength is inversely proportional to the distance squared. The number of available destinations increases with travel time, assuming a uniform density. Of course, cities do not go on forever, or even 115 minutes, and do not have uniform density, but the number of jobs does increase with distance. In five minutes, we can barely leave the civil engineering building. Ten minutes away, the number of jobs increases. Twenty-one minutes away, it increases more. It looks like the figure drawn on the slide. Now, at some point, you reach the edge of the city, where the curve stops rising and starts flattening, because then you don't have very many opportunities at the edge of the city. But for a while, it's like this. It's steadily increasing with distance. You can think of it as increasing like the area of a circle because you're steadily increasing the number of potential opportunities. If we were to go out 115 minutes at a uniform population density, our city might have 40 million opportunities. No U.S. city has 40 million opportunities. Some Chinese cities will probably be there in a few years. Some megacities like Mexico City or Tokyo have about 30 million people. Willingness to travel decreases with travel time. All else equal, a traveler is more willing to make a trip that's 5 minutes than one that's 10 minutes, and more willing to make one that's 10 minutes than one that's 15 minutes. Here we graph the two curves on the same graph. If you multiply the cave curve with an opportunities curve, you get a curve that looks like the share of trip destinations. You can't have trips that are going to be fewer than zero minutes, so there's no negative, but you can have trips that are longer and longer. In principle, someone could be commuting here three hours or four hours. There are people who have very long commutes, over 90 minutes, or two hours each way. Not very many of them, and all of them have newspaper articles written about them. They are called super commuters. The distribution of trips is going to vary by trip purpose and mode. This probability distribution function data is for work trips. The area under each curve sums to 1. Transit trips are longer in duration. In part, this is because transit is slow due to stops and high access costs. In part, this is because people commuting from far away are taking commuter trains so they can do something else while traveling. This also varies by trip purpose and will skew to the left for shopping trips and to the right for longer intercity or vacation trips. We ran a model where we used what we just estimated, coefficients based on travel diary data, and we compared it against observation. And this cumulative distribution function tracks pretty well, although not perfectly. Destination choice cannot be solved in isolation from other model components. It requires we know travel times. However, estimates of travel time require knowing travel demand. This system of models needs to be solved iteratively in practice with some kind of feedback and convergent mechanism.